Welcome back to the Credible Dev YouTube channel. Today, we're going to start the process of setting up a Windows Home Lab. And this is going to be part of a series of videos where we're setting up an Active Directory server, SCCM server, connecting the on-prem or our virtual Active Directory server to Azure and getting it in there, working on the replication, talking about Intune and how to get devices set up in Intune, all sorts of things. So this will be many videos spread out across the next few weeks or months. But today we're going to be starting with an Active Directory server on Proxmox. If you don't already have Proxmox, I'll link a video that walks you through the process completely on getting Proxmox set up. And while you could do this in other tools such as VirtualBox, for example, you won't be able to follow along exactly with some parts of the video. It's, you know, when it comes to the setup of Proxmox specifically, there's going to be some differences there, obviously. But overall, you could probably achieve the same thing while doing this in VirtualBox or some other virtualization tool. Uh, so if you don't have access to Proxmox or a server that you could set it up on, an old desktop, uh, anything really, that has a, some decent specs to it. You don't want something that, that doesn't have a lot of CPU cores or a lot of RAM. And by a lot of RAM, you know, 16, 32 gigabytes of RAM is probably going to be enough for you to do what we're going to be doing here today and in the future videos. I just wanted to preface that, that you could do this with other technologies, but to follow along with the video, you would need Proxmox. And before we get started, uh, I also want to say that you're going to need a few ISOs, and I'll have all of this linked down in the description. You're going to need an ISO file for Windows Server uh, 2019 or 2022. I'll be using 2022 in this example. You can get those free as an evaluation for Microsoft. Again, links will be in the description. You're also going to need a Windows 10 ISO. I'll be using an LTSC version. You get that for free as well on an evaluation. And you're going to need the Vert IO drivers if you follow all of the exact steps that I do because I'll be using the Vert IO uh, storage and for the network controller on the virtual machine. And to do that, you need the drivers for Windows. If you choose a different one, uh, not the Vert IO, IO, then there'll be drivers built into Windows. So if you follow along the exact steps, you're going to need that ISO too. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So an Active Directory, if you've never heard of it, it's basically, it's very common in organizations of all different sizes. It's a way to manage the users, permissions, devices, configuration policies so maybe you want to set a desktop wallpaper the same on all the machines in this group and a different one for this group of machines stuff like that you can do with it uh, you could do a lot more with it we're also going to be managing dns and our dhcp server those aren't necessarily active directory uh, but they are related and you commonly see those with the active directory server sometimes they all run on the same server some organizations may split them up onto separate servers. Active Directory is not super resource and, uh, sensitive, especially for what we're going to be using it for. So you don't need a lot of specs um, in order to get this up and going. But the reason why you may want to do this in your home lab is because you're trying to learn more about Active Directory. Maybe you're new to IT and you're trying to just brush up on the technologies and understand them better. So when you go to apply for a job, you can speak to them better. Maybe you're just wanting to set it up as a test lab so you can test things that you wouldn't be able to do in your production environment in a controlled dev environment where you're not going to you know, break anything, basically. So those are just some of the reasons. I've used it heavily in my career just to learn how the technologies work, play around with things. Sometimes I would even test out things that we would eventually do in production but i wanted to prove out that they would work and that there weren't any negative side effects to doing whatever it was i was doing i could do that in my lab uh, so we'll be doing a lot of things here i'm pretty excited about it i hope you are too and if you're interested make sure you subscribe so you get alerts about all the future videos in this series as well so without further ado it's enough talking let's get into creating this active directory server so the first thing we want to do is in Proxmox, of course, we want to create a new VM. 
and you can change the VM ID if you want. I am just for some organizational reasons, but you can leave it as whatever the default is. I'm not going to go too into the weeds and uh, Proxmox and what all the different settings mean. And you can research that on your own or check out previous videos if you have any questions. You can also leave comments down below and I'll try to answer those for you. So we're going to give this a name. We'll say it's a DC01. That's for Domain Controller 1 which is how we refer to these Active Directory servers. Their domain controllers are going to be the controllers of the domain. A domain similar to, you know, a website domain, something, something.com or whatever. Our Active Directory forest is going to have a name. And we'll decide what that is later, but uh, we'll be using a dot .local since it's just a home lab and we're out time to this to anything externally or anything like that. So we'll go ahead and hit next. And here we need to choose the ISO file for Windows Server. So you should have already downloaded that from the links in the description. And we'll find the one for Windows Server, which is going to be this one. And we'll change the guest OS type to Windows. And we'll keep this on 11 slash 22 because the ISO I downloaded was for Windows Server 2022. If you download a different one, you'll want to make a different choice there for the version i'm not sure if it'll actually break anything if you chose the wrong one but just to be safe choose the one that matches what you downloaded and for system we'll go ahead and set up the efi storage and the tpm storage i gonna leave everything else here the same for the disk i am going to change this to a different storage and we'll make this 80 that's more than what we actually need and we'll change this to vert io block and if you decide to change this from the default that's where you're going to need the vert io drivers and that iso is linked down below as well and we'll hit next and we'll give it two cpu cores we'll leave it with the four gigabytes of ram for the network for me i need to make a change here because i'm isolating this from my network for everything else you can leave it as the default if you wish unless you've set up something else here i'm going to choose vert io2 again i'll need those drivers for that we we'll hit next and then finish and before we start up the vm we're actually going to go into it and we're going to attach that vert io iso file so we'll go to hardware click add add a new cd dvd drive and here I'm going to choose my ISO storage and then I'm going to choose the vert IO win ISO here. And that'll make it easier for me to install the drivers during the Windows setup. So at this point we can go to the console and we can click on start. So we'll wait for this to boot up. And we'll click on next, install now. And here we're going to choose the desktop experience. Can't quite see it all there, but we'll choose the standard evaluation desktop experience. Hit next. That'll give us the full graphical environment for Windows Server. Agree to the lengthy terms that we're not going to read. We want to do custom. And then here you won't see your drive, and that's because you need to load that driver. So click on load driver. Click on browse. Go to the vert IO ISO. AMD 64 and then I'm on 2022 version if you're on a different version choose that folder here we'll hit OK we can see it found a matching driver so we'll hit next to install that okay so now we see the drive here we'll go ahead and hit next and then we'll wait for the standard setup to complete and I'll come back whenever that's finished Okay, once the setup is complete, you'll come to this screen where we need to configure the administrator passwords. We'll go ahead and do that now. And with Windows Server, it's a little different than Windows 10 when it comes to the console here in uh, Proxmox. You won't be able to just click to get to the login screen if you've ever done that with Windows. On uh, Windows Server, you're going to need to hit Control Delete, and you can do that through this side menu here. We'll go ahead and do that, and then we will log in. 
And if you've never logged into a Windows server before, once you log in, you'll get server manager to come up and that's where you can manage a lot of the roles and settings for your server and everything. So that's where we'll be doing a lot of our work initially. There's a few things that we need to get configured before we install the Active Directory domain controller role and promote this as a domain controller. So we'll go over those things here. The first thing that we're going to want to do is change the name of the server. So if you go to local server here on the left, you'll see computer name. You can click on that. And then here you can click change. And we're just going to call this DC01. We'll hit OK. We'll close that out. And it's going to ask about restarting, but we're going to restart later because we're going to change a few more things. Another thing we want to change is the time zone. So we'll go ahead and update this time zone, whatever is appropriate for you hit OK there and this will update after we restart it will stay whatever it originally was until then and then this IE enhanced security configuration we're going to turn this off just because it's annoying in production you're probably going to want to leave this on but for our purposes I'm going to turn it off we'll hit OK then we need to assign a static IP address but before we can do that, because I chose the BERT IO driver, I need to make sure I install that. So we will run this BERT IO win GTX64. Run this, and it'll give us all the drivers that we need. And we'll hit next. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up a command prompt here as well. Right. So that is finished. And then what we're going to do is um, down here, we don't have any network connectivity. You may have network connectivity, but because of the way I've configured this network in PFSense, that's what I use for my router. Um, the interface, the network interface that I chose for this VM, we go to hardware. You can see I chose this bridge VMBR1. That is assigning it uh, to this win test interface that I have. And I currently have DHCP disabled on it because later we're going to run DHCP through this Windows server. So it's going to be different for your router and everybody's setup is going to be different. If you just got a standard configuration, your, your virtual server that we just set up probably has a network connection right now. And that's fine. But you're probably going to want to look into your router's documentation on how to assign a static IP address. Sometimes they're just called reservations. There's different terms that different routers use for the exact same thing. The point is, we want to make sure that this server always has the same IP address. And if you don't do something uh, to make that happen, like assigning a static IP address or what have you, then it's possible that the IP address is going to change every so often and we don't want that to happen in our environment we want it to always be the same so it could be that your router hands out ip addresses in a very particular range so if i did have this enabled you could see that the range is from 9.100 to 9.150 so as long as i were to pick a ip address that is not inside this range i would be fine or I can come down here to the bottom and I can assign IP addresses specifically, uh, which is what I'm going to do. Um, just to be sure, I don't really have to do this. Uh, you'll see when I go to configure the IP address in the Windows server, I could just do that and it would be fine. But instead, I'm going to do it this way. So I need to go to Proxvox and I need to get this MAC address here. And your router may require this as well. And that's how you will assign the IP address. You're going to have to have a way to tie it to the machine. And the MAC address is the best way to do that. So I'm just going to update this MAC address. And this means that any network interface that has this MAC address, which there would only be one, every network device has a different, unique MAC address. So that's going to identify this VM. I'm going to give it this IP address and it's got this host name. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. Then we'll go back to the VM. And 
and we will right click here and open network and internet settings we'll change the adapter options go to properties on that go to internet protocol version 4 also referred to as IPv4 we'll go to properties and then we're going to input that IP address 192.168.9.10 it'll pre-fill out the subnet mask for you and then we will put in the router or well the default gateway so this will also be different in your case so you'll need to look that up and a lot of your cases it's probably like 192.168.1.1 it's different for me because of this extra configuration that i've done and for now for the dns server we're just going to put in 8.8.8.8 .8 and later we'll be changing this but for now this should work and we will save that I'll hit close and now we should be able to run IP config and see that we have that IP address and I should be able to ping google.com so we can see that things are working here so now we can move on with restarting this server and once we do that we will work on installing the active directory service and promoting this as a domain controller so go ahead and restart all right so our server's back up we need to log back into it once we log in again server manager will pop up automatically and then we can install the role and promote it So to do this, we want to add a role or feature. So we'll click on Add Roles and Features. We'll go to Next. We're running a role-based feature. So we'll go ahead and hit Next. And then here you select the server from the pool. It's the only server we have, so we'll keep it there on the default. And then what we need to do is check this box for Active Directory Domain Services. And we'll hit Add Features. We're also going to go ahead and install DHCP and dns dhcp is what handles handing out ip addresses for this network now depending on your setup you may not want to do this because you likely already have a dhcp server like your router for instance it's possibly handing out the ip addresses for your network but for my case since this is isolated and I'm going to use this Windows server to hand out IP addresses, I'm going to install this role. And for a DNS server, that's important because we need to be able to resolve internal names of our server. So like this server was called DC01. If I want to be able to access this server from another machine on this network by that name, DC01, you need DNS in order to be able to do that. And we're going to be adding other servers in this series and to be able to access those from say this server or anywhere else within this network we need to have dns configured and set up so that those devices get put into dns and there can be a translation between the host name like dc01 and the ip address that it's given so we'll go ahead and hit next here we'll hit next again next again Let's keep hitting next here and then we'll hit install and once this installs then we need to promote this as a active directory server or domain controller and in that process we'll have a few other things to configure but once we're finished with that then we can get into setting up a windows 10 virtual machine joining it to this active directory domain we can also do other things like group policy management and show you how that works as well. Okay, let's finish with we'll it close. And then you can see we have this little notification up here. So if we click on that, you can see it says configuration required for Active Directory domain services on this server. So we'll click on this, promote this server to a domain controller. And since this is our first one, we want to add a new forest and we're going to give it a name here so let's call it for me i'm just going to call it cd cloud for some future reasons and we'll call it local 
You can call it whatever you want here. Put dot local on the end of it, and you'll be fine. We'll hit next. Now this force functional level, I'm going to leave it as default. And for our test environment, it's not as important, but in a production environment, you may need to alter this to something older. This is for backwards compatibility, but for us, we'll just leave it at the 2016. And we're not going to be setting this up as a read-only domain controller, so we won't check that box, but we'll leave everything else checked. And then we need to put in a password here. This is for the restore mode. You probably won't ever need this password, but you never know. Next, and here we don't have a DNS server set up just yet, so you get this error message, just hit next. And now it's going to configure the NetBIOS domain name, and this is backwards compatibility stuff that Microsoft does as well. And it should just put that there for you automatically. We'll hit next. And this is going to be the path for different logs and, and files that Active Directory uses. In a production environment, they're probably not on the C drive. But for us in our test environment, this is completely fine to leave it this way. Hit next again. Now it's going to check the prerequisites to make sure we have everything we need to install this role and to promote it. And all of these are just informational things. We can just go ahead and click install. All right, so we have it installed now. We'll go ahead and restart. Well, it went ahead and did it for us. All right, once your device restarts, you'll be back at the login screen. So we'll log in again, and you'll notice now we have that NetBIOS name, that CD Cloud that I configured. Yours obviously is different unless you use the same name. You'll see that and then a slash an administrator. And that's the indication that everything's set up correctly, and now this is a domain controller for the CD Cloud domain. So we'll go ahead and log in with that same password you configured before. And we'll get server manager to pop up automatically again. And now we're going to go ahead and create a domain admin user. Now, the domain admin user is an account that has a lot of permissions. It's a, a dangerous account. You want to make sure that you protect it. And you want to be careful what you do while you're logged in as that account because it has full control over a lot of aspects of Active Directory. So in a production environment, you're not going to hand out that role to very many people. And you want to protect any accounts that have that role. But for our test environment, it's not near as important. So to do that, we want to go over here to Tools. And we're going to go to Active Directory Users and Computers. And this is where we can manage computer accounts and user accounts. And you'll see here we have our domain, the cdcloud.local we expand that, there's already a few things here. And Active Directory is broken up into organizational units. Typically, you'll have an organizational unit for users and computers, and within that, you'll have them broken out maybe based on different buildings, different sites that you have, different regions. There's a lot of different ways that you could do it. In our test environment, we're not going to get too fancy, but we are going to create a couple of organizational units just to get us started. So to do that, you'll right click here and you'll go to new and then you'll want to go to organizational unit. And we're just going to call this users. We already have that. I forgot. We need to create an uh, overarching one. Sorry about that. We'll just call this corp. And then within this, we'll call this users, or not, organizational unit, sorry, getting mixed up there. We'll call this users, and then we'll right-click on Corp again, and we'll create another one that is for computers. And then under users, we'll create another one that is called admin. 
and then we'll create another one that's just called production, let's say. And we'll do the same thing here under computers. And again, these names really aren't that important for us in our test environment. And you can organize these however you wish. Now, under admin, under users, we're going to create a new user here. So I'm just going to call my user BD. And the login name is the CD. Give it a password. And I'm going to uncheck this box for a user must change password and next login because that's just annoying for our test environment in a production environment. And you probably want to use some of these options, you know, whenever you create these accounts, especially changing the password at their next login. That way the user can choose whatever password they want, not what you chose for them. So we'll go ahead and click next here and it will click finish. Now we want to right click on the user we just created and go to properties and go to member of. This is where we could add the user to other groups or roles. And here, I'm just gonna type in domain and it'll do a little search. And here we can see the domain admins group. I'm gonna add my user to that group. Hit apply, and we'll hit okay. So now we have a new user set up. So at this point, we can create our Windows 10 virtual machine and join it to the domain. The user that joins a machine to the domain needs specific permissions to do so. Not just any user can add new machines to our domain. They have to be privileged to do that. There's other privileges that you can use to just give somebody that right, uh, which we'll look at later whenever we do the SCCM server setup. But for now, we'll just use our domain admin user to join other machines to the domain and do the other management tasks that we're going to be doing. So at this point, we're going to create a new VM and we're going to install Windows 10 on it, join it to this domain. Now there is one more thing that I'm going to need to do in, before I set up this additional VM and that's to create a DHCP scope. So we'll do that now. Um, you may not need to do this depending on your setup as I've said before, but if I add another VM, I'm going to have to assign its IP address because I don't have DHCP configured. So I need to create a scope so that way this server will hand out an IP address to the um, to the new VM. Let's go ahead and complete the DHCP configuration. We'll close that out. And then under IPv4, I'm going to make this larger here. I'm going to create a new scope. And then we'll just call it uh, production. And then 192.168.9.100. And this is going to set the scope. It'll hand out IP addresses between this range, 100 and 150. And we'll hit next. We're not going to add any exclusions. Uh, we'll change the lease duration to be eight hours rather than to be there. 23 hours. Not all we want. We'll do eight hours. And that's just how often that uh, a new lease would have to be requested from the machine. So that way, if you if you had an environment where let's say you had VMs that were constantly like building and destroying themselves, which you might have, say, in a VMware Horizon environment with instant clone pools, the VMs are kind of spun up as needed. And then they, the, the amount of VMs shrinks back down over time. So if you have an environment like that, you want to set the lease time really short. So that way, as machines are getting destroyed and they're not getting replaced because everything's shrinking down, 
the IP addresses in that range would become available again for another VM to pick up that IP address. Otherwise, you run into issues with running out of IP addresses in the scope. And when that happens, any new device that connects doesn't get an IP address at all. So do we want to configure scopes? We will go ahead and configure scopes. Uh, or Yeah. So our router is going to be just like what we configured on this machine. And basically, this is just predefining the things that uh, when a machine gets an IP address, those settings that it's going to get for like the DNS server and stuff like that. And we'll keep that as the default. Um, it's going to assign this DNS server to any machines that get an IP address in the scope, which is what we want. And we're not doing any wind server configuration. Do we want to activate it? Yes. So now we'll finish that. Now we can go ahead and create our Windows 10 virtual machine. So we'll go to create new VM. And I'm going to give this the ID of 801. And we're just going to call this Win 10-1. And for our ISO, I have a few different ones here. I'm going to use this uh, LTSC one. Windows, and we'll go to 10 because this was a Windows 10 ISO. Pretty sure it was. Yeah. yeah. So we'll hit next. And then here for the system, we're going to leave. Uh, actually, we'll go ahead and change this to UEFI. And we'll add a TPN. Might use it for something later, like BitLocker. Um, we'll go ahead and hit next. I'm going to change this to vert IO like I did on the previous one. Change my storage. And like the storage setting is going to be different for everybody. Um, so I can't really tell you what to pick here. But you're going to want to pick one of these where you have space to hold this VM. And we'll give it 60 gigabytes. It's more than we really need, but it'll be fine. We'll give it two CPU cores. And we'll give it four gigabytes of RAM. And here, again, I need to change this bridge. Uh, you wouldn't have to change that if you don't have the setup that I have. And I'm going to change this to Burt IO. So that means that I will also need to attach that um, Burt IO ISO to this machine in addition to the Windows installation ISO. So we will go ahead and add CD drive. And we'll add the BERT IO ISO. So at this point, we can go ahead and power it on. <clears throat> and this time we should not need to manually configure an IP address like we did on the uh, on the server setup because we should be getting it from DHCP. Okay, so we'll just go through the setup. It's very similar to what we did on the server side. And for me, I'm just going to choose this first one here. And depending on what ISO you downloaded, you may see different options there, but if you chose a standard Windows 10 ISO, you're going to want to install Windows 10 Pro at least, uh, that or Enterprise. Uh, if you try to use the Home Edition, you're not going to be able to join it to a domain, I don't believe. We'll choose Custom, and we need to load a driver here. We're going to do what we did before on the server, go to the AMD64 folder. We'll choose Win 10, and hit Next. And we can see our drive there, so we'll hit next. And then we'll wait for this to complete. And once it uh, completes this and restarts, we'll pick back up. All right, our machine has finished the setup, so we'll go through this portion of the install. It's fairly basic.
And here you may see a different screen. I'm not getting an internet connection here because I need to install that driver once we get everything set up. So I'm going to choose I don't, I don't have internet, but uh, you may have internet, so this screen uh, may look a little different to you. Just wanted to call that out. Going to tick all these off. It's just habit. It's less things for Microsoft to track. Not that I'm really concerned about it in this test environment, but why not? So now we're at the Windows desktop, and for me, I need to go ahead and install that driver. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Just like before on the server, exact same steps. And once I do this, we should see that my device gets an IP address and that it's from that range that I configured on the DHCP server. Looks like we do. Let's open up a command prompt and check it out. And we can see it gave us the 9.100 address. So if we hop back over to the domain controller and I expand this and refresh it, we should see that device we do so we want to go ahead and change the name of this device and we want to join it to our active directory domain so to do that we'll go over here to properties there's a bunch of different ways to get to this screen um, but if you just right click on go to properties and then advanced system settings we'll go here to computer name we'll click on change so we're going to call this win 10-1 and then for the domain we're going to put in cdcloud.local. So that's going to be whatever you configured it as. For me, that's what I decided the domain name would be. And then we'll hit OK, and we'll be prompted to log in to this domain. And we'll need to do that with the domain admin account that we created earlier. And then once this is done, it'll prompt us to restart this and then we'll go ahead and restart and once this machine comes back up it will officially be joined to our domain we'll be able to go back to the domain controller look in active directory users and computers and find the device and your device once you initially join it it'll show up under this computers folder here and for me i'm going to move this device you can just drag it and move it into this production Folder here or OU. And now we can see that computer lives here. And this will allow us to create policies and apply them directly to this OU, and they will only impact the machines that are in this OU. You can also apply policies to, like, say, this Corp OU. And then they will be inherited by machines or users that are in uh, the lower OUs. So it's a pretty handy feature. Let's go ahead and hop back over to the machine, see if it's back up yet. And right now we don't see the domain here, but if you click on other user, we'll see sign in to CD Cloud, which is what we want to do. So we'll test signing in with our domain admin user. And we can see we successfully logged into the machine with our domain admin user. We didn't add this user to this machine as a, as a user account. It automatically happens because we were logging in with an account that exists on our domain. So now at this point, uh, what we would want to do is create a test policy. So if we go back to our domain controller and we go back to server manager and go to tools, and we go to group policy management. This is where we can create and apply different 
types of policies and there's tons of these in here you can control all sorts of things such as the browser if you want to configure how the browser browser acts like say you don't want the user going into the settings of the web browser stuff like that you could do you can configure how the desktop looks and acts uh, you can disable a lot of different features and windows through there it's it's really handy for you to just pre-configure devices in a sense once a device joins the domain if it's in the proper OU where you apply those policies you restart the computer it comes back up and it has all those settings that you configured so we're going to create something very basic here just as an example so we want to go into corp and we want to go to computers and production that's where that machine exists we'll right click and we will create a GPO in this domain and link it here. Linking just means that it's going to apply it to this production OU. And we'll call this um, local admin. And we'll hit OK. And now what we'll do is go ahead and click on this and go to edit. And I believe it's under preferences, control panel local users and groups that's what we want what we want to do is is show you how you could add a user as a local admin on all of your devices or all the devices that live in this ou it's a very basic policy but it's an easy way to, to understand how this works so what we want to do is local group and then under group name we'll click this drop down and we'll go to administrators built in because every windows machine has an administrator's group in it. So we're not wanting to add a new group, we're wanting to update an existing group. So what we're gonna do is click on add here, then we'll click on those three dots so we get this pop-up here, and this lets us look for users that are in our, our uh, Active Directory. So the domain admin that we created, Domain admins are generally already administrators on the devices themselves, but we're just going to add it explicitly here, and we'll see that show up on the device once it gets this policy. So we'll hit OK, and you can see it's got the name of the user here, and it's prefixed with the domain. That's what you want to see. So we'll hit OK. Now that's going to add this user to the built-in administrators group. OK on that, and if we close out of this, and you can go back over here and you click on settings. We can expand this. Just click show all at the top. If we scroll down, we can see what's happening that we're adding or we're updating the local administrator group, the built in one, and we're adding this member to it. That's what this policy is going to do. So if we go back to the device, we open up a command prompt. You can try to force policy updates by typing in GP update forward slash force and run that. And while we're waiting on that to run it, it usually doesn't take very long, but if you have a lot of policies in your active directory, then it might take a bit longer to process all of those. And then we're going to go to manage right here. And then we'll go to local users and groups, and then groups, and then administrators. And we can see here that the user we added with the policy shows up here. So now this user is explicitly a local admin on this device. But as I explained earlier, anybody that's in that domain admin group is already an admin anyways. But I was just doing this as an example for you to see how setting up a policy works. So... If you want to create more policies, you can. You can add more settings into one policy. So you don't have to have a policy for each setting. You can have a policy that consists of multiple settings. So maybe you want to create a group policy that is, you know, a base configuration for your device. And you could create that and then put all the settings in there that you want for your base settings and apply that to all of your devices or just some of your devices if you wanted. Same thing applies to user. You can create policies for users. And I don't think I mentioned this, but these policies are called group policy objects. Um, they're GPOs is what people refer to them as typically in, in business environments. 
And so if you hear that term, that's what people are talking about are these policies here that we're applying. So at this point, uh, where we're at now, I know this has been a bit of a long video and maybe a little bit of a struggle to get through, but hopefully you learned something from this. Uh, we've installed Active Directory on a Windows server. We've installed um, DHCP and the DNS server role on that server. And we've also created a Windows 10 virtual machine and joined it to the domain and created a policy. So for our future videos from here that are going to be in this series, as I talked about before, we'll look at, you know, connecting this with Azure Active Directory, the cloud-based Active Directory, and how to get the sync to work between the two. We'll talk about setting up an SCCM server, which is a lengthy process to a degree. It's got a lot of prerequisites. It's a bit of work to set those up, but once you've done it a few times, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, we'll probably add another Active Directory server to this domain. So then we have two of them. We have some replication going between them. We have a DNS server running on that one too, and there's replication there. So if one of them goes down, your people can still log in because the Active Directory server that we just set up is now critical to the machines that are connecting to it. So if I were to power off this domain controller and then try to log in to that machine, uh, right now it, my account's cached in there, but if I tried to log in with another account, say we added a, a second account to our domain, I tried to log in with it, I'm not going to be able to because it's not going to be able to authorize that user or, you know, authenticate them against the Active Directory server because it's down. So you want to make sure that you have redundancy. So that way, if one of them goes down, your people can still log in. They can still access their stuff. They get their policies and all of that. And like DNS is very important too because these devices are looking to that Active Directory uh, server to resolve their domain name. So if you try to go to a website like google.com, it's not going to be able to resolve it because it can't talk to the domain controller where DNS lives at. So it's really critical to our environment. So we'll probably look at adding a second one of those and how that process works. A lot of things we can do here. Like I said, I'm pretty excited about it. It's an interesting topic and it's very useful information if you work in a corporate environment where a lot of it is windows based windows servers and this kind of stuff it's going to be extremely helpful for you to understand how it's set up how it works how to use it and and that type of stuff so anyways i've rambled enough so if you have any questions comments something specific that you want to see leave a comment down below and let me know and let make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on those future videos and if this video did help you out be sure to hit that like button that's all i got for you today hope everybody has a great week